Hey, dear listeners, 90 Day Fiance, let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As I always say, don't use YouTube as a replacement for therapy. If you need a therapist, get one. You deserve it. Let's watch. I just want to say something to you. What's the dilly? I do want to apologize the way I acted yesterday. I came in from such a long flight and I was so tired. And to come here and, you know, I wasn't really expecting everything. Yeah. I should have never had an outburst or say things to you that was unkind. All right, you know me, I always appreciate a good apology. And this is an example of one. I believe her, it seems sincere. Many would argue that it's not justified. I think it is slightly justified. If I were to put a percentage on who was to blame in the overall festivities the night before, I would say Bilal was 95% to blame because he lied and lied and lied and lied and lied and lied. And then it's patriarchal, 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 patriarchal. <laughs> I mean, that, that I didn't expect. I mean, the lying we had heard about, I think during episode one, so I was kind of prepared for that. But the the way he was talking down to her, the belittling, it wasn't extreme, but it was alarming given the context and that he she just got off the plane. So, and usually throughout the season, we see that escalate. Maybe they want, you know, other cast members have surprised me at times where we'll see an indication of something early in the season and then we never see it again. So maybe it was just stress for him, but we use this as a jumping off point and what she did, I'm guessing in her mind, she's thinking, well, he essentially deceived me by make, giving me the impression that he was of a certain income level and never indicated otherwise and was mysterious about where he lived and his cars and his income while we were on video chat for the past two years, even though we're already married. So I was just having a big question mark around that, but I figured once I saw his house, it would all be congruent with the way uh, he was presenting himself. Uh, at least when I saw him in person, you know, the accoutrement indicated that he had wealth or at least wasn't in a house like this. But when I saw this house in that in that van, I d thought, what is going on? And it was concerning me because I thought, am I being was I catfish this whole time? Which, it, you know, so this is in her mind, which would be complete legit. And she also might be thinking, so are we in a struggle here financially? Because that I didn't know that's what we were getting into, what's going on. You know, you can, allow, you can imagine that there would be some concern and some hurt and anger towards Bilal around that. So you imagine she's thinking about that overnight. She might even be texting people, getting some backup around that. But that's not what she leads with. What she leads with is her part of it, taking responsibility. I am sorry. And as a jumping off point, we can say, Whenever you're trying to reconcile with your partner, I'm guessing you've been in this position before, it can work well. Not always, of course, you know, if you're in an abusive situation, it, you know, that's always a different category of advice. But uh, barring that, you want to take responsibility and apologize, lead, even if you believe you're only 5% to blame. It takes a big person, it takes a mature person to do that, it takes a confident person to do that, it takes someone who has been treated well, honestly, to do that, because in order for us to withstand the that liminal space of, well, I'm only 5% to blame, but I'll apologize. You know, there's a there's this zone of uncertainty that you're heading into, because what if he's like, well, thank you, I accept your apology, and then moves on with day, and you're like, wait, so I was 5% responsible, and I apologize? This is some serious BS. I rescind my apology. And you don't want to do that. It's vulnerable. It's, you can get more hurt in that situation. So you need to have the maturity and the growth and the healing from whatever relational traumas you have, the differentiation to be able to take that leap. And so you do that and then it, one, it's the right thing to do. Two, you know what you did was wrong. And even though it was only a small wrong, it was wrong. And the other person deserves to get an apology. It will, you know, kill him with kindness kind of thing, pr promote or in encourage, engender in Bilal feelings of wanting to apologize as well. And it's just a good pattern to get into. One of the best patterns I can see in a couple when I talk with them in my office is that 
they will approach situations like that. Conflict, 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 then a break, and then apologize. You know, someone that's their, you know, they don't say, hey, you got to apologize to me. They just take responsibility and apologize. And if everyone does that, because every time you do that, it teaches the other person that you care, that you're able to take responsibility. It sets up this unwritten rule in the relationship that one should apologize. It kind of sets in motion a protocol for doing so. You might you might even be modeling to your partner uh, the proper way to apologize because they might have never seen that before. And it promotes a lot of wellness in relationship. And honestly, you know, life is too short then to hold on to these grudges and these righteousnesses <laughs> to say, well, I'm only 5% to blame, so I'm not going to apologize. Life is too short. And it's also a matter of perspective because, you know, when I talk to couples uh, along these lines and I'm really trying to convince them to adopt that point of view because sometimes they believe they're 5%, but they're really 50%. And so regardless of what percentage you are, just apologize, you know, and don't get into a debate as to who's more to blame. Because if everyone apologizes and addresses it and tries to be different in the future, then we all win and we don't have to decide who was mostly to blame, right? But some people, when I'm trying to convince them to do this, it's just really hard for them to get over certain certain ideas that are prominent in our culture around like, well, that's toxic if I'm being forced to apologize when he did something wrong or, well, if I apologize for it and I don't demand an apology from him, then I'm just validating his behavior and then he's just going to keep doing it. You know, you got to you got to hold people responsible. You know, you'll hear that a lot like we got to hold people, you know, to take responsibility for their actions. And in some circumstances, that's a relevant sort of tack to take or perspective or principle to follow, but not in situations like this. If they both held each other responsible in this situation, they'd probably just escalate the fight and then where are you? Whereas if you take responsibility for yourself, and I remember early in my life learning this lesson, and I obviously have not always followed it in my personal life. I think I've done better as I've aged. But I remember, I think I saw it in my parents. They would do this and I would say, oh, wow. Like that was, it, it takes a big person to be able to, in the face of someone else actually seemingly being more to blame, just take the high road and say, you know what? I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm sorry for my part. And, and just period. No buts, no howevers. I'm sorry. And for me, when I do that and the other person doesn't apologize, I still walk away because I have a perspective that promotes this, that I feel satisfied because at least on my side of the fence, I've done the right thing and I can sleep well at night. If the other person hasn't done their part, I feel like they're going to suffer. I feel like they are going to, they're going to lose. I'm the one that wins if I apologize first, even if I don't get an apology from the other person. You know what I mean? And I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I appreciate one, your apology and I accept it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry for any my part as well, too. One of my concerns and, and that I kind of. All right. So, Bilal, this would be a perfect opportunity for apologizing for all the lies, the hundreds of lies and deceptions by omission and straight to her face that you've committed. So. Hopefully that will come. I can't believe he's still going on with this ruse. So hopefully that'll come to an end at this point. Yeah. I'm unable to work for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you are my sole Please. provider. Right. Can Us. you take care of me, Bilal? I would not have brought you to KC with not the intentions of me be able to take care of you. Yeah. This is a pet peeve of mine on the show frequently, as you all know, that people in significant relationships, engaged, married, they're married, and the man does not have a conversation with his spouse about finances. They seemingly, the women in these situations, which is often the case in traditional gender role relationships, which I do not recommend, by the way, unless it somehow works, which sometimes it can, 
not that the woman is left out, but the woman, or regardless of gender, one partner might just be like, you know, I don't want to know the finances. Just, you know, it, it bothers me. You take care of it. Some people have anxiety or whatever. But uh, without seeing any evidence of that, which I don't know if I ever have on this show, it, it just it irks me that the uh, situation is such that the woman doesn't feel like she can say, look, I want to see all your bank accounts and I'll show you all mine. Let's sit down. Let's write out a budget. Let's figure things out because it's our money. You might be earning more than I am, but it's our money. Let's look it over because I want to know what we're working with right now. And the fact that that never happens, the fact that the man in this hypothetical general situation never invites that into the equation is uh, perpetuating a, a patriarchy and a control and a uh, forced submissiveness, a infantilization of women that has been going on for centuries in our culture. And in this situation, we're seeing the damage of that because if after they got married or when they got engaged, they had had that conversation, then this whole situation would have been resolved. But of course, for Bilal, he doesn't want to do that, at least consciously, verbally, what he's saying is that he's worried he's being played and that she doesn't really love him, which you've heard me talk about all the wrong headedness of that. And well, not the wrong headedness, the the, the disconnect, the incongruency with, you know, okay, fine. You don't trust her. Well, don't marry her then. <laughs> like, if you don't trust her, fine. You know, you, you have some questions. Give us some time. You don't have a lot of time. You've had seven days in person. Makes sense you don't trust her. How about you give it some more time in person? Me that is big is, like, gratitude. I see you wearing a little T-shirt. Oh, I mean, I just wake up that way. Right. So what people will say is this is passive aggressive, right? And is it passive aggressive? Because people use that term in a, in a very broad way, in a, kind of a specific way on the Internet to uh, denote people when they're kind of being sarcastic or smarmy or they're playing games. And sometimes I think it's an accurate usage of the term. And what I always say is instead of passive aggressive, think hidden hostility. Because passive aggressive, it, it, I think people don't really get what those words mean. Hidden, meaning that you might not even notice that it's happening. So that is, so thinking about that, that's not exactly passive aggressive. That's just flat out aggressive, not meaning physically violent, but it's hostile. It is a criticism. He, I mean, maybe it's inadvertent, maybe it's subconscious, a Freudian slip of the shirt, if you will be grateful because that was his whole thing that he was saying last night it's just like his his paternalism even comes out in his clothing towards her and so that is or you could consider it hostile or at the very least she is interpreting it that way so it's not very hidden right and thus not passive in the passive aggressive sense one could say that it is somewhat passive and that it's not direct right it's indirect so you maybe you could say it's passive aggressive in that way, but a truly passive aggressive in in my field, the way we use the term in the clinical literature is passive aggressive would be like he well actually this whole lie you could consider to be hidden hostility that he is worried that she's playing him and tricking him, being a gold digger as people call it, and he's hurt by that because he's invented this story and then strikes back at her through a hidden hostility by lying to her. So she doesn't even know she's being lied to. And that's how passive aggressive passive aggressive is. It's so passive, it's so hidden that the individual doesn't even know what's happening. But for the communicator it it satisfies them because they feel like they are being hostile. They are getting the other person. They are uh, insulting them or criticizing them or controlling them or harming them in some way. And that is what they believe to be a healthy expression or a valid expression, I should say, of their anger as a result of their hurt. But it's so passive, it's so hidden, the receiver doesn't even know it's happening, but they might feel the effects of it, which I, I think she is. But it, if you were to ask her, 
does this house represent a hostile act towards you? She would probably say no, because she's like, well, this is his house. What are you going to do? But from the outside, knowing what we know, it could be a hostile act. All in all, when I woke up this morning, I was thinking a lot about her perspective, where she was coming from. And I, I, I definitely understand it. I do think that she could have said it a lot better, but we put that all to the side and I'm looking forward to a better day today. If he hadn't said those other things in previous instances of, I'm, so what do I mean by paternalism? What I'm talking about is I'm more important. She needs to obey me. If she gets out of line, I'm going to get stern with her. She has to be grateful. She can't complain. I don't want to hear any guff from you. And it's one directional. And all those double standards involved. So that's one aspect of paternalism. There are other aspects as well. So that's what I mean. Is like a, you must obey me. And I don't want to hear any complaints. So I'm because I'm guessing we're going to use this word. So I, I should probably be precise because I don't like it when people just throw out these words like toxic or gaslighting. It's like, be precise. You know, you can use the word, but always give some sort of clarification as to what you're referring to. And I, I should say paternalism and in the, the type that says you must obey me. You, you, and I don't want to hear complaining. Obey, might, that may be a little strong, but at the very least, I don't want to hear any complaining. Stop complaining. I don't want you, your feelings aren't valid, that, that kind of thing. And be quiet. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's it. Again, it's a little strong, but he he did say, I don't want to hear any complaint. He literally said that. And uh, yeah. And then he says, are you going to complain or are you going to help make this home into a nice home? And she's like, well, I'm going to do both. I'm going to complain and I'm going to make it into a nice house. And he didn't like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's paternalism. That's what I'm going to call it. So if we hadn't heard those previous paternalistic you, I don't want to hear complaining aspects the, from the previous day. What he just said would seem like, well, okay, but it's all kind of in that category. Give your hug because I know you said that you were on your way. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, baby girl. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry again. All right, love you. Love you Send too. your apology. Love you. Bye. I apologize for peace because my family is like 3,000 miles away from home. I have no one here. I just have Bilal. No. Yikes. She's saying, I apologized to promote peace because I don't have any support here. And I'm so dependent on him now because because of the visa process, I can't work. And if he is unhappy with me, my life could really just fall apart at this point. So that's concerning, which would, of course, add into the dynamic of infantilization and control and, and paternalism. But trust me, it's definitely going to be something that we're going to have to work on and talk about because I am not, I'm not done yet. We definitely have our work cut out for us. All right. Well, if you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, that's the best way that you can support what we're doing here. It is actually the way that I can do this is because people become patrons of the podcast. And there's always a certain amount of people canceling. So we always need a new group every month where it's like, oh, God, are, are people going to sign up this month? It's a, you know, no joke. It's a little bit, of, you know, because I, I essentially quit my job at the university. I still teach there occasionally. But so I depend on the patrons to a large degree. So if you want to and you can afford to then go for it by clicking the link below if you don't want to if you can't afford afford it no problem also if you can become an annual patron or an upper tier patron two thumbs up to that and please take care of yourself because you deserve it you really really do